Hi, my name is Gergely Sipos, alias Shipi. Uh, I've been working with Ali since 10 years. Um, most of my time here sp I spent with uh, front-end development on various projects. And yeah, I try to tell you something you don't know. Maybe. And this is Mokka in the flesh. He is a <laughs> Java engineer here. Yeah, I, I'm doing Java sin, since a while, since uh, 2009. So I, I saw, um, yeah, a lot of uh, legacy code, and uh, nowadays uh, less and less legacy code, which is good. Um, I'm an architect at Audis, uh since uh, two years, and uh, team lead. Um, yeah, that's about it, and we can talk about the other things after the presentation while holding a beer in our hands, uh, which you can do also right now if you wish, especially if you are not really um, amazed by basics. So a lot of you have voted with yet you have already worked with GCP technologies. If uh, this is uh, kind of too trivial for you or something, you can uh, have a beer if you wish. Uh, so let's start, uh, shall we? So um, welcome everyone again. And this is a presentation about application development basics on GCP. We have done several application development projects uh, here at Ali's, uh, both for clients, because obviously that's where the money comes from, and for ourselves um, to make our lives easier. Uh, today, we would like to talk about two recent projects uh, while our memories are still fresh. Uh, one project which we delivered to a big enterprise client and another one which we have developed for our own convenience. So, our first case study uh, will be a project uh, which we did for a client. Here we always have some constraints, architectural guidelines, and rules and expectations. The bigger the client is, usually more so. Uh, less time, at least my team got lucky, and uh, we had a relatively high degree of intellectual freedom with just a few architectural guidelines uh, to follow. Uh, they prefer, for example, asynchronous communication with other systems, which is reasonable, possible. Uh, use the client's blueprints if you're doing something, if it's applicable, and uh, do automated disaster recovery, which was another interesting topic, which you won't talk about today. And uh, some stuff regarding security, yeah, let's just begin. So, I think this is the most fortunate development cycle you can imagine. Uh, so, what, what shall we do with our freedom? Um, this is what developers always want. And this is, uh, and uh, this time, uh, the client was, uh, has fully agreed, rip and replace. So, um, in this case, the decision makers had the courage to get rid of the old world. Um, I know we all think that uh, once we have the opportunity, we are, we'll, we are building uh, well-architected, prosperous and everlasting wonders uh, of engineering uh, when we have the chance, especially on Greenfield and even more so when we're doing this on the, in the cloud. Um, but to, to be honest with ourselves, uh, in at most two decades, it will be a dystopian disaster anyway. But never mind that, never mind that, let's begin. So we started on Greenfield. So we started like this. Really simple, right? It's a simple web, uh, web application based on the holy tri trinity, backend, frontend, and database. Um, the database is Cloud SQL. Uh, we, have, we could have chosen some no SQL solution. Nobody told us to do this. But since the client wanted a lot of tables and ordering and uh, filtering and stuff like that, SQL seemed just too convenient for that. And they didn't really need it, uh, like scaling or anything. It had not a big load. So we've chosen Cloud SQL, which is a fully managed Google service, works just fine in these simple use cases. Then we have uh, Cloud Run above it, uh, which is neat because um, with just a few simple parameters and configuration, you can uh, deploy a, uh, almost any Docker container. Okay, it has a. Uh, it needs to have uh, an active port which it listens to HTTP requests and stuff. But nevertheless, you have fairly big flexibility in uh, 
um, deploying uh, a Docker container. It scales automatically, is nicely managed. Um, it's very simple to use. And yes, we could have chosen anything which we wanted, like uh, uh, any language of any version and any framework. And we've chosen Java 17 and Spring Boot because we're developers over 30 and that's what we are familiar with. So that's what we went. We were a bit conservative in this, but okay, we had the freedom to do anything. Um, and the front end, uh, oh yeah, there's a, a load balancer um, which uh, uh, had some forwarding rules whether uh, uh, the request should be forwarded to the back end or the front end. Uh, we have here um, cloud CDN for caching and uh, uh, on the um, bottom right uh, you have cloud storage where we uploaded our built front end artifacts and app engine not because we needed any kind of computing in, in the front end, it was static content but uh, we needed some for uh, some routing uh, magic there because it was a single page application and if the root was not found we still forward, uh, forwarded the request to the index html where the react application did the routing but i'm not that familiar with every detail of the front end because uh, you know i'm a java developer and um, but I had, the pri I had the privilege to learn and uh, practice a little bit of front end after nine years, and I found it a lot less horrible than back then. Uh, so I just uh, give the word to Shippy right now to talk more about all the front end magic which was happening. All right, so on the front end side, the client had uh, less uh, thoughts about how it should be done. So. Uh, we were free to choose uh, what we wanted to use, but um, well, we had to choose something that's uh, uh, well known, some library that is stable, good for enterprise uh, environment. So, what we have right now, as you can see, uh, is pretty, pretty um, standard. In the front end world, pretty boring maybe, but pro boring can be good. So uh, let me go over it just a uh, little. So TypeScript, because <coughs> TypeScript is for maintainability and no project should be done in <coughs> pure JavaScript nowadays. Is there any JavaScript purist here? Oh, <laughs> so. He's lying, I know him. Um, so, next, React, because it's a well-known framework, productivity, stuff like that. Um, Mobex for state management, because uh, Mobex is fairly easy to use, fairly easy to teach, if someone not knowing how to use it, um, in spite of Redux, which is more kind of popular. Um, ESLint and Prettier are tools that allow us for additional code quality checks and, and formatting and stuff like that, uh, which is always nice to have a standardized way of, of doing things. Parser.js is the one that is uh, building the front-end application from source files to the stuff that we actually deploy. Um, how many of you know Parser.js? Not many, all right. So, in modern web development, actually there are a lot of things happening between you having a JavaScript file and what you deploy. And <coughs> Parcel is basically a multiple tool in one that uh, compiles TypeScript, uh, concatenates the JavaScript files, um, minifies them, um, uh, processes our image assets, all the things that we probably need. Um, there are other tools like uh, Webpack, which needs a lot of configuration that you don't need to do with Parser.js. It's a zero configuration tool, uh, so it's just plug and play basically. And we use Material UI because it has a lot of components and 
uh, easy to use. Uh, we don't have to worry about CSS too much. And lastly, but not least, we did our end-to-end -end testing with Playwright, which is a Microsoft library, by the way. Um, it's actually a headless browser environment, so you can you, uh, run the test against your application running it, running in a real browser, which is always nice. <coughs> and yeah, so this whole thing is just pretty much standard. It's not much what enterprise uh, environment requires us to do. It's what modern web development looks like. The enterprise nature of the project came from uh, uh, the other rituals surrounding the uh, development. Like uh, we were just one team under an umbrella project and every team had their own uh, front end. And this lot of small front ends were aggregated into a big portal that was, uh, um, you know, it, it's for the user, it appeared as one single application, not just uh, 17 different applications from 17 different teams. This, of course, required us to have strict uh, design guidelines so <coughs> that applications all look the same way. And uh, the front end was deployed with Terraform. Or Terraform? I'm not. Yeah, I'm not, not really a friend of that. Uh, and other, other kind of things that you might not need, like uh, conventional commits, which is pretty good if you are want to generate uh, change logs. If you don't, then you don't need it. And the client actually uh, asked us to have pair programming and even mock programming for knowledge sharing. Um, I don't know if you ever had mock programming, it's like 10 developers sitting together and, and one is typing, other, other 10 is just telling what he has to type. It's <laughs> awkward. So, someone says it works. Um, I didn't uh, experience that. Well, yeah, I think a, a good review, code review culture is, is actually more beneficial, if you ask me. Okay, so. Uh, jumping back, uh, tell us what enterprise means on the backend side in this case. Yeah, so there are always uh, some funny things you have to do. Um, like we had a fairly superficial view on the backend, and this is also part of the backend. You see the same uh, Cloud SQL database there, but it needs to be fed, uh, it's hungry. So uh, we need to feed it the product data, and how do you do that? Well, you have a big e-commerce client, you have approximately uh, like 8 million different product variations which you have to import into the database and you have to like maintain them, you know, update them every once in a while. So how do you do that? Well, this is something you wouldn't really do for fun. So first you send a query, what kind of products are they? And you get back 8 million of them. <laughs> okay, you page through them and then they say, okay, how do we get the details, the attributes and stuff? Well, you have to send an HTTP request for each and every one of them, um, which lasts approximately a day, actually, and they also have one more constraint, that please, uh, uh, you, have, you should be querying only 10 products at a time. You should be like considerate to the, uh, the target you are querying. So we have done just that, so that we have the same uh, kind of SQL database. We have another cloud run service which does all these HTTP requests and stuff. But since that's stateless, you don't want that to supervise these uh, 10 uh, requests running in parallel and all the scheduling and everything, now would you? So we have cloud tasks, which does exactly that. You can easily configure that, that okay, you want 10 requests at a time, and you also want some kind of retry mechanism if something fails and you want to see in the logs that, uh, yeah, there's something not going right if you retry and it doesn't work. And just one minor other thing, that we not need a fixed e IP ad address because security is important and username and password is 
like uh, not uh, enough anymore and we have to whitelist our IP address at the system where we are sending the request set. So there you have it. You are sending millions of requests for a day or so, um, 10 at a time with a fixed IP address and everyone's happy. Um, but this one's only once, right? Not exactly. We had an occasion where they changed like um, mm, a core data, some kind of ID in all the products. Then you suddenly get it another 8 million updates and this one's again. So yeah, that's how it uh, looks, right, looks like. Um, and you, you don't always understand this kind of decisions, why, why this uh, should be the most efficient stuff to, uh, or most efficient method to update stuff, but uh, this sometimes happens. And if you add a few more of these uh, little things, it's still not like uh, the 100% ready product, it's just where we uh, are at right now, we're at. Uh, and um, yeah, this is how it looks like. To be honest, there are two applications. You see the, uh, this whole eternity at least two times, like front and back end and database and stuff, and uh, a few data integrations, and this is what you get. I know this is still not rocket science or something like that. It's still not overly complex, but it looks weird if you're just thinking about like very, very simple three-page web applications with just uh, two kinds of data sources mostly. Um, so we jump now to the other world where everything's perfect, of course, where we love ourselves, we do everything for ourselves, it's self-care, and uh, we do everything perfectly, of course. So there you have our tool, uh, um, which is named Emma because we like uh, women names with uh, just four letters, and uh, this is the employee majestic management application. Um, which we um, started to develop at a hackathon. Um, we, we, for, so we had an event where we coded for our um, for fun, and we wanted to do something useful. So we coded Emma. It's a central app for a lot of policies, sheets, employee data, career goals, hopes and dreams, sometimes despair, uh, which were scattered and lost before in different places in Google Drive, BigQuery, and other third-party tools. So we started with Emma, and it looks kind of like this. Okay, I'm cheating here a little bit. You know, uh, it seems that everything is a lot simpler and nicer. That's also uh, partially due to the fact that we are less rigorous in documenting stuff when we do stuff for ourselves. When the client pays for it and demands it, of course, it's, uh, it has more detail. Here, you know, the parts are missing where how we integrate this stuff into BigQuery, but <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, you can see some similarities and differences. Like, um, we use BigQuery here for our single source of truth at the end, so we have different kind of, uh, different kind of data sources because you cannot really avoid having different data sources and make your life a bit complicated. We use, for example, uh, Google Workspace Directory API, Google Sheets, of course, a Google Calendar. We use Toggle Resource Room, whatever, your choices for, for this booking, resourcing, and whatever stuff, but you have different stuff. And we try to load them into, uh, I mean, we're loading it into BigQuery, which is great to collect and analyze data, but not so great at like constantly querying it. Uh, from an application because uh, it's meant for analytics and data warehousing and it's not so great uh, for simple and low latency queries. So we have a syncing job which syncs some data triggered by a cloud scheduler, some data to the Firestore DB which is a NoSQL managed solution from Google. Um, here we are okay with NoSQL because we have less uh, table stuff to do with ordering, filtering, whatever, it's like, you know, less uh, Excel-like, the whole thing. So we use here Firestore and we have uh, an API, uh, also in Cloud Run. And uh, guess what? There are some similarities with the uh, previous application, so we use Cloud Run, at least, as a similarity, and we also use Java and Spring Boot, even if we do our little hobby projects, uh, some, we have some Node.js uh, 
and services like this employee data thing is an OGS service because it's really, really simple and uh, there we didn't want to have this whole uh, Spring Boot config and, and whatever. So we just have one, kind of like one uh, JavaScript file and uh, yeah, we have the other API which is Java and Spring Boot. Mm. No, so in the end we have something which is seems like just a ki uh, slightly different from uh, the uh, solution before, but the front end looks a lot uh, fancier. So I'm sure that we have like nothing, uh, no similarities at all in the front end. Chippy will tell us more about it. Well, it's quite similar <laughs> because. Yeah, in theory, we could choose any kind of front end. We could choose the most uh, newer one, like Svelte, or Vue.js, or something like that. But there are two issues with that. So first, uh, since this is an in-house project for just ourselves, no one is paying for it. We wanted to do it by limited resources. And there, that's something that we want to choose libraries that we actually use, actually know, so we can uh, be productive with them. Secondly, uh, we wanted this application to be a <coughs> learning ground for uh, newer developers or backend developers who want to go to uh, the full stack direction so they can uh, take some uh, features and develop into the front end part as well. So that's why we choose some React TypeScript uh, stuff to to give them some knowledge that uh, they can use on the project. Um, we simply use Material UI similarly, ESLint, Prettier, all these tooling <coughs> are quite similar. They are just good to use. There are two differences actually. First one is using React Query <coughs> instead of Mobex because in this application there are a lot more static content, not much interactivity, so there are no that difficult and complex state management required on the front end side. The second is Vercel, which we use to deploy our application. Uh, how many of you know Vercel? Couple, couple, there are good, good. So uh, for those who don't know, Vercel is a service that you that uh, is used for front-end deployment and hosting. It's what it does is basically you point it to a repository, tell him uh, what command to use to build the application and the folder to host. And then it goes and does all its magic automatically, deploys your pull request, your uh, branches, commits, all, all have their own uh, URLs, so it's a very, very uh, comfortable and easy way to uh, deploy and host your application. Plus uh, info, if you have a, a personal or hobby project, then it's very good to use because it's free for personal and hobby projects. Um, also, one of the nice features that we want to explore in the future uh, came out uh, last week, maybe. So, Versal is uh, when you deploy it to a developer development environment, it uh, gives you an overlay that you can see on the right side uh, where you can comment on, on the parts of the UI like you would in like a, a Figma design or, or something. Uh, so you can um, do the testing and, and uh, communication more uh, directly and in a fancy way. Also, if you don't like Versal, you can check out Netlify. It's basically very similar to it. Uh, yeah, so what else? As you can see in the screenshots, um, it's based on Material UI, but Google Material Design is very, how should I say, um, official, pragmatic, and not something you would use for for uh, funky and, and uh, 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 how should I say, mm, 
It's, it's too, too, too simple and too um, nothing colorful. Standardized. Standardized, yeah. And since this is an application built for our community, uh, we want it to have a, a look that it's more uh, uh, fun and engaging and something that's not that official. So <laughs> I just Googled design trends in 2022 mm -hmm. and there were <laughs> glass morphism. So what, what does it do? So CSS uh, has a fairly new feature, which is a, a backdrop filter, which allows us to create this frosted glass effect. What it's good for is that you can now play with uh, content that is overlapping or background that has something. In this case, we use it that our application has uh, background images taken from our uh, annual team building, so it's more like personalized for us. Uh, so here is our photographer who, <laughs> who does all, all his magic to, to look us more beautiful and professional even in our team building. So, in, in conclusion, tell us about. Yeah, yeah, we um, have, as you see, like some similar sources, like spreadsheets are hard to avoid. Like, uh, okay, uh, enterprise clients want to use Excel, we use our own Google Sheets, which is so much better than Excel. At least it has some like uh, cell level permission settings and stuff like that, so we kind of like it for some purposes, but if you're overusing it, of course, it's going to be hell. Um, there are some things that uh, we can do differently for ourselves, like the design, as you can see, like uh, in the left side, it's very visible that you uh, make a table from an Excel, which is slightly nicer and custom, but, but it's still like very uh, table-like, and for ourselves, we can um, make something which looks nice, or frosted glass and uh, super pictures and whatever. Um, so that there are some things we can use, uh, we can um, do differently, um, but there are some similarities too, like um, under the hood, um, we, we have still a lot of data integration to do. Uh, we use a lot of the same GCP products like, um, like Cloud Run, and um, we, mm, well, although we don't have uh, some extra uh, non-functional requirements for our application, uh, but we still use like uh, very similar frameworks uh, in for our own projects and for a client, like uh, React and TypeScript and uh, Java and Spring Boot and whatever. Um, and Versal was a very nice thing to try out. So one of the one of the big um, differences here was that um, if, if you are taking yourself really seriously, of course, you use uh, Terraform, you document everything, and everything has to be like uh, disaster proof. Uh, but when, when we do it for ourselves, we simplify some stuff, we beautify some stuff, and uh, we, mm, we can try out uh, these stuff like Verso, which, which is like very easy to use, very helpful, and uh, yeah, that's kind of it.